Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this evening. We've looked at um, a range of different landscape types so far in this series. So new town parks, commercial landscapes, landscapes to public housing. And in this section, we're looking at public and semi-public um, parks and gardens. So last week, Kate strolled us through Ian Hamilton Finley's improvements at Stockwood Park in Luton and the inspirations he invoked with his design ideas. Our objectives with these talks is to raise awareness about the work and ideas and thinking of the original designers and also how these sites are now looking to see what we can learn from this and take forwards to find out more about where the relevant archives are and what makes these places still so very special. We're thrilled to have some wonderful speakers who've shared their detailed knowledge, experience, and passion for each one of these post-war designed landscapes and gardens added to Historic England Register um, year before last. This evening, we're delighted to welcome back Ed Bennis to talk about Peter Shepherd's garden on Cheney Walk in London. So Ed was head of the School of Landscape at Manchester Metropolitan University and head of the Centre for Landscape Research, who's visiting professor at a number of universities in China and Europe and Israel. He's been a landscape consultant to English heritage and regional governments and chairman and trustee of Cheshire Gardens Trust. Ed, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Annabelle. Can you hear me? Are we okay? Yes? No? Yep. Yes. Okay, yes. good. You're never too sure when you're just talking to your computer screen. Um, I thought as we start, first of all, I must thank Annabelle uh, because she was the one that sort of got me involved in doing or working on the book on or the LDT monograph on Peter Shepherd some years ago. And also Ken Fieldhouse, who's long left us, but it was Ken I met at a conference in Portugal. We we're both giving presentations, papers. And afterwards he said, would you like to write a chapter on uh, uh, Peter's uh, gardens? And I said, I don't know anything about Peter Shepherd's gardens. And he just said, you will by the end of it. And so that's where it all started. And so that was quite a few years ago now. And so Annabelle asked me if I would give another talk. And similar to the one I gave on Jellico and Morton, it's impossible, I think, to give a talk on the one site for the uh, allotted time. So I want to put some context around Shepherd because I'm not sure that many people know about him. But I thought rather than starting with the pretty picture of the finished site or what it looks like today, it's a case of looking at it in 1957, 58, which is the way Peter Shepherd would have seen this site uh, when he first, first arrived. And I could almost hear him now saying, oh, oh goodness, what, what, what can we do with this? It's the sort of comment he would have made. Oh, wrong one, just get the right button. There we go. Now, <clears throat> Shepard has a long history of design and work in basically Britain and in the Philadelphia, New York area as well. He came from Birkenhead. Uh, that's where he was born, uh, studied architecture at Liverpool University. And you can see from all this, I'm not going to read this at all. Uh, and I could have done an even longer list of the various projects he worked on. But he was an architect, a landscape architect and town planner. Peter eventually became uh, Dean of the Graduate School of Fine Art at the University of Pennsylvania in the later years, 71 to 79. And it was in that period where he became a, a, a knight, uh, so it's Sir Peter. And so he's had an interesting sort of pile of projects. And thankfully, the book that uh, Annabelle edited really gives us an insight into Peter as a designer. And even looking at this picture, the thing that strikes me, first of all, simple things like he never wore patterned ties. There were always silk ties of single color. So it's very specific about a lot of things. Now, one of the early projects that he did, and I said this helps to put things in context, was Summerhill in Kent, 1946. And you have Elizabethan house, and he proposed this sort of quite detailed, really sort of um, 
uh, modular uh, modernist garden. And it was never built. And there's quite a few projects that were never done. And as I said, it was completely different from the character of the formal garden and indeed from anything in terms of gardens that we knew. And there wasn't a great deal of modern modernism in the gardens in, in this country. It was sort of a lacking thing. But I thought his own self-assessment of it some years later, I was crippled with this modern thing. You had to do ghastly grids and things, and it was, wasn't connected to the house at all, completely separate. Being completely separate doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong. But also, as you start to look at the drawing on the left, you start to see Peter's ability with pencils and with watercolor. It was absolutely amazing in terms of drawing, as well as the plan work. Festival of Britain, I think, really gave him a boost in this country. And some of the gardens that he did, this sort of pavilion on the left, which was for homes and gardens. And he was, he was very much, a lot of his work shows his very strong geometry. Uh, within the gardens and the landscape, but then completely contrasting it was the moat garden, which was really his favorite, and along with a lot of others. And he referred to the moat garden being extremely fond of growing weeds. And anyone who's seen that garden knows about the fact that he likes weeds. But Peter had a hard time with this. It was post-war, and a lot of the plants that they would have liked to have used were not available. They just could not get them. So it was a case of going out and scavenging. So in a sense, the gardens create, were created by what was available at the time. And there were other things that he was doing, such as uh, in, in later on in 1966, GLC housing. And when you start to look at Peter's work, and if anybody's familiar with the University of uh, Lancaster. Again, it's this very, very simple structure of buildings and spaces, a good balance. And Colin Ward said, nobody's really going to say an awful lot about his buildings. Below 1969, the underground carriageway and public walkway proposal for the Houses of Parliament. I can just imagine this would be a terrific place for meetings with wine and cheese right now outside that building, although the press would see everything. We're going to look at a few of the examples that he did in, in the States, um, mainly because you'll see a lot of detail and different features repeated by Peter, and it gives you a better idea of, of what, what he was thinking. In 1962, he was invited to the University of Pennsylvania as a visiting lecturer, and he was invited by no less than Ian McCarg. And McCarg was noted for Design with Nature, his publication some years later. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And he later became Dean of the Graduate School of Fine Art. In fact, he was Ian McCarg's boss. What was interesting about this particular site is that all the buildings you can see in the white with the black outline, nothing actually fits together. The buildings are completely different styles, different periods. There's no real connection. There was no real planning, except there was space around the buildings. And Peter's approach was that it is the landscape that is going to actually unite the buildings. And he put quite an extensive proposal together, um, which I said he had this terrific ability to be able to draw and present things, but also he was very personable in being able to explain things and I think sell things to people. So this is the sort of drawing, the booklet that he produced, um, which really explains what he's doing, why he's doing it. Uh, and of course, remember, this is all before we had all the computer-aided design graphics. Uh, and so just, I said, beautifully simple things. And some of the things that you start to see in here, you're going to see in a lot of his other work, and that is the paving that you have in here as walkways versus main routes. And again, what he's doing, he's breaking down. In a lot of cases, this will be a single level going across, and which it is in this case, because 
what he was trying to do is reduce the visual impact of very wide roadways for access, for vehicle access, for emergency services, uh, for building works. And so he put these bands of different paving, usually smaller paving and larger paving in here. Now, this is slightly different. This is asphalt pavers, and it was Robert Moses, who was the director of the New York City Parks Department that developed this particular paving block, a hexagonal form. And if you've been to Central Park or a lot of the parks in New York City, you'll see the same thing used there. It's, it's a very durable, uh, long withstanding material. And they actually implemented this. And you can see in here the sort of idea of the, the different paving materials. And in here, he's got brick, then he has the asphalt paving. And another little detail, if you put a curb in somewhere, people tend to stay on the pavement rather than if it was flush, rather than walking across the grass. It doesn't mean it always stops them, but it does help. But he's very keen that his landscapes were meant for people. And he does refer in other cases like this on the bottom left, where people could just snooze in the sun. And Philadelphia gets very hot in the summer and it has hard winters. So I said it really did give a nice retreat in sunny areas and shelter uh, in the winter period. The sort of sculptures, you'll find sculptures in quite a lot of his work, but this sculpture, because he was actually head of um, fine art, which architecture fell under at the University of Pennsylvania, is related to the textiles there and fashion industries, because it's a very, very large button. And in here, you can now see very clearly the uh, hexagonal asphalt and the brick paving and, and then the curb. And this is for another example site somewhere else where he's looking at basically a type of York stone in here. And he gives dimensions for different sort of widths and different routes, sort of uh, primary, secondary, third levels of, of routeways going through here. I said, it's been an extremely successful design and it's actually held up very, very well. And I think part of it is the endurance of his design work is its simplicity. It's actually very straightforward, very honest. I remember Peter saying one of the art or the real art of the landscape architect is to take a lot of really complex issues and simplify them into sort of a single design. Oops, sorry, I keep doing that. I'm used to using the mouse. <clears throat> Longwood Gardens, which is outside of Philadelphia, um, Peter became the consultant there for a few years. And Longwood is, is a great horticultural institution. And it was interesting going there. I had, I've had a couple of trips there to look at some of the things there. And I met with a man called Bill Fredericks who actually hired him uh, to, to be their consultant. And he said he stood out above everybody very quickly in terms of the quality of, of, of his uh, work and his approach to things. And Peter was very good at dealing with committees. And so he, he could manage committees very, very well. It was quite a skill. And that is Peter on the left and Jeffrey Jellico on the right in the image. And while he says he did very, he did little things, but very important. Some things weren't so little, and they certainly were very important. Um, there was a whole remodeling of the whole entrance facade of the building. He extended the main building in neoclassical style, new car parks. Actually, it's, it's a delightful car park. I've parked in there and it's, it's, it still works, uh, even though it was done quite a few years ago. And uh, it's, it's, its design work is interesting. There were planting areas to the front. And he said, he just designed where the beds went, but he said, this is a horticultural institution. So he left it up to them. They know about plants more than he does, which in some cases was true, but not always. The, one of the changes that he did make, and just behind where the photograph is taken on the top left is a little fountain. You can see it in the plan. Uh, it's a little dot uh, just here. That was the first fountain that they had made at Longwood. And so it's actually quite an insipid little fountain. It doesn't really do much, but it was so distressed that um, they kept painting it blue in terms of, you know, we want blue water, so we have to paint the concrete blue, whereas he wanted black. 
And he never did get his way on that. But what's interesting on this is long walks, 650 feet. It's huge. And it was all this bedding plants, completely bedding plants. And I took these pictures at two different times of the year, as you can see. And he referred to wiping people's eyes with the display of beddings, bedding plants. And it, the problem with the walk is it actually had no context. It, just, it was just stuck in the middle of grass areas. And so what Peter did do is he started putting plants in, you can see in the plan, to actually anchor it into the landscape and hedges or walls. In fact, it's a wall, new wall going around here. Oops, sorry, it did work that time. And the most interesting point is you can see this walk going down to the bench, which is a, uh, a, a whispering bench, rather like the same thing you get in St. Paul's in the rotunda. You can sit at one end here and speak to somebody against the wall and the words go around. But he also reinforced this with the hornbeam hedge at the back. So it's, it's a very theatrical sort of thing. But as you walk down, the point being is that if everybody continued to walk down straight down the center, nobody would be able to see it. And he found these plans by Thomas Church, who had preceded him as a consultant. And Church had made this proposal to actually split the walk with a grass turf piece of land in between. So that as you enter, you come to this fountain and then you can actually see the end. So because people walk down the edges, it was a very, very simple solution. And you can see in here, the hedges and uh, the backdrop. He was annoyed that they used the wrong sort of hornbeam. They used a fastigate variety uh, where he just wanted a normal hornbeam in there. And that was replaced later on because the fastigate, it just didn't grow together sufficiently uh, to form a solid good hedge. Another little project, and this is not little uh, in its day, which, um, I think it was a $50,000 job, which was a lot of money then, that he redid the lily ponds. And the top right drawing by Peter shows the existing situation and these small little bits uh, of water bodies. And then the, gr the areas in between were actually grass. And so they were getting worn out. The areas for growing lilies were really too small. And so he gave, a, he produced a much simpler idea with uh, much larger beds and different depths so that they could grow different types of water lilies in here. So you can see his drawing. Most of his drawings are pencil and not that many color, but he's just as adept at using color as he was doing a pencil drawing. And he was very good in interesting details. Again, the original sort of edging in here rather like that pond being painted blue, all the edging was painted white, which he absolutely hated. And so that was to go. And rather than having this dominant edging, what he did is he put this sort of like an engineering blue brick in, but it's just slightly tilted up. And so there's an edge, but there's no real sort of deep edge. And uh, it's just, just a little warning, change in color, change in texture, and a slight, raise level here stops people from getting too close. It's the little warning sign. This actually increased their growing area by 52%, which is an enormous sort of increase in their, their growing areas for their lily collection. And this is what came of it in the long run um, with these. It's, it becomes like an island, really, with the water beds and there are some solid areas. But uh, you get the feeling that the water goes all the way around this um, with the central central waterbed. And these are quite famous uh, water lilies that uh, uh, Longwood had, had hybridized. And these are the ones where you see a child sitting on it. Uh, uh, so it's uh, a very, very sort of successful design. And again, extraordinarily simple. And what you start to realize, simple is actually very hard to do. I came across this, and I'm just going to, I've got some stuff on my screen I want to get rid of. Uh, when I went to the University of Pennsylvania, where he was dean, um, there were some archives there. And it was interesting because 
and there were things he just left behind. And I looked at this and I had no idea who this was from. Well, as soon as you saw the drawing of Peter, um, you knew who it was. It was you and Maggie Casson. And Peter had introduced, because it was a school of fine art, he introduced life drawing, which you can see he's got a nude model in here. And in those days, the only people that were allowed, only students allowed to draw nude models were students on art courses. But he had architecture students, landscape students drawing nudes as well. So he was a bit radical for them. And so there's this delightful note of congratulations um, from uh, Hugh and Maggie. But I also found some other things which were really rather nice. Um, there was a, a, a congratulations note from Hermione Gingold, the actress who was in Gigi, if you recall her as the grandmother, and also from something called the Happy Bottom Fanciers Club which Peter said, I don't really remember that. I have a feeling that was more in denial than, than remembering it. And then another one, Frank Rizzo, who was currently the mayor of Philadelphia, sent him a telegram for his 60th birthday. Happy birthday, stop, you decadent, limey, pinko, intellectual artist, stop. I am going to deport you, stop. I asked Peter about this and he said, I don't think I knew him. Well, I doubt that Peter did know him, and if he did, he would not want to have anything to do with Frank Rizzo, who was one of the worst uh, mayors in history in that city, in most cities. He was also a well-known racist. He was done for uh, bribery and corruption, and so I, I can't imagine that. I think this was another one of his friends doing a joke for him. Let's see, why aren't we changing? There we go. Right, this side of the pond. Um, there's two key gardens that I want to look at. One is Goldsmith because it basically precedes Roper's Garden or Cheney Walk and, 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 and Cheney Walk. Now, this one is again, a sunken garden. And if we look at the plan in the bottom, we're at street level out here, there's a walk in and this actually rises up to where we see the trees on this top level, a few steps up. And then as you move around, then it drops down into this sunken area with the walls around here with these piers and very, very narrow strips of planting. It's, it's the one thing I do think he could have allowed a bit deeper planting areas, but there were seats in between all of these as well. And what's interesting in here in many ways, here is this different pattern of the larger and the smaller, as you can see up here, paving materials, and then the raised curb against the grass. No signs of grass wear there at all. But also, it's just these odd angles. Rather than actually having this squared up, he's repeated and reflected on the layout of the streets out here, and he's followed those patterns rather than actually squaring it all up. And you'd end up with slightly different shapes in here in terms of the paving. It could have been hidden by, by the uh, planting. So, in here, the, the planting is generally quite wild in terms of climbers on the wall, bird boxes on the wall. He was a very keen uh, on, um, in terms of his bird life, wildlife and animals. And if you look at the LDT monograph, it's, it's actually littered. It's almost like confetti with sketches in the margins of the various things of birds and animals that he did at various times. So the lawn follows the external street pattern. One tree in the corner, which I think is a catalpa, I can't quite remember, I can't read the plan. And I think these are sort of key things that you see in Peter's work later on, and certainly you're going to see them at uh, Cheney Walk. And as we move to that now, Roper's Garden was actually a gift from Thomas More to William Roper and Margaret Moore in 1521. And then, of course, was built around here and much of it was destroyed. Uh, it was basically all destroyed by a parachute mine in 1941. So I think this drawing is probably early 19th century. And this is, of course, what Peter found when he came to Roper's Garden, also Cheney Walk. 
And this is from the London Picture Archive, and there's some notes on there. But there were fences made of sticks, chicken wire, barbed wire. There were daffodils, iris, and roses, workman sheds, paths and walls made of brick and rubble, and wartime allotments. And I think any of us looking at this would certainly feel challenged in terms of what in the world can you do with a site like this, except certainly bulldoze it. But of course, there were buildings here, and we have different levels. And the same that he did at Goldsmiths, he started to look at the idea of dropping the garden below street level out here. And he also took these walls. So if you drop the, drop the garden and raise the walls, you actually increase the height and we can actually hang and, and look over it. And you'll find that goes all the way around here. And at the far end, there's actually a ramp in here uh, for um, disabled or more to the point, I suppose, at the time, more for ladies with buggies, uh, prams and push chairs, and there are steps at this end. Sculpture in the middle, but then almost what becomes part of his sort of formula in design, these sort of grass plots with the raised curb, the smaller sets, and the larger paving. And then between the piers, the benches, along with, of course, bird boxes that were in here. There's a raised platform and shelter overlooking the garden. And again, it is basically simplicity plus. But there's, there's the odd thing. He did follow the roads around here. And the perspective, um, a radius point was 168.5 feet away, focusing on the church. But I think that is not so much the fact that it's uh, 168 feet away, it's because of the road layouts around it and the angles they were at produced this sort of thing. And it's another drawing that he produced for it. And you start to see very few architects are that enthralled or enamored with plants the way he is. And we can actually spot his bird boxes in here. And the idea that these plants were really to, supposed to grow over the top and just hide the walls completely. Um, but he said the uh, Burr engineers kept chopping them back, so he wasn't terribly happy about it. So this idea of dropping, you know, five or six feet below the level already, and then you put a wall above it, then you've got this eight or nine foot drop. Now, the nice thing about that is that you're sheltered from the noise of the roads around it, and it feels much more private, but it's still open. Some of the things he did like, and again, in planting, and we'll talk about that towards the end, you can see what looks like digitalis, foxglove in here. And he liked these tall, spiky plants. He thought they really added drama. Iris is another plant that he particularly liked and had in his own garden uh, in Hampstead. Keep doing that, I must stop. And you can see now on this plan, you can see the angle, how, how strong it is. And of course, everything's focusing on the church tower up here. But there are a series of spaces this being the upper raised level, the sort of central space. And then this other rather sort of, almost like a secret garden of different planting in here. And then there was, <coughs> excuse me, there was a, um, uh, a sculpture added some years later, we'll see that. But the ramp comes in here, that isn't shown uh, on this plan. I think that's where it is, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, and then steps over here. And then you can see very clearly, again, the walls, the paving, uh, the raised curb, the central feature of a, of a sculpture, the, the awakening by Gilbert Ledward uh, sits in the middle. And I suppose what makes it so successful? One of the things he produced was a little book called uh, Gardens. And it was really for the home garden. But one of the things he talks about is perspective in there. And I talked about Jellico and perspective um, in, in uh, the talk on Morton, but this is quite different. Also, if that is the case, that Peter is using these things very subtly, it almost sounds a little bit like uh, Jellico's idea of appealing to the subconscious, where Peter really didn't buy into that. He, he approached design from a different, different tack than Jellico did. We can see a sculpture in the distance in here. 
and the main central sort of uh, sheltered spot. And it's always a case, I quite like this. I've never seen it empty. Every time I go, a few people have found it sort of snoozing in the sun. And this is so typical. It was a very nice one, just the way he underplays and understates things. I think there's a great humility in the way he deals with his own work, much less others. There's the ramp. And this is to the right is the sort of almost sort of semi-private area. It's, it's quite different. This is the one thing I've, I've never convinced about. I'm still not convinced. I think he could have been a little bit more generous in the depth of area for planting. But at least here, the vines and creepers are growing over the wall as he intended. We don't see any over on this side. And some of the plants he used, you can see the climbers, the clematis, the uh, vitus, the hydrangea, and mixed in with some roses here and there. Uh, and then, then his favorite sort of um, herbaceous plant, which when you think about those as herbaceous plants, they are the sort which really require modest amounts of maintenance and are fairly long lived rather than having to replant them every few years. Uh, the Epstein sculpture we could see on the left was added in 1972. So it wasn't part of the original design. I think Shepard's planting is fascinating. And in Modern Gardens, which he published in 1953, there are plants all the way through it. And he has these little sketches in the margins of the, uh, um, of the uh, uh, of, of each chapter. And these, these were the sketches that were going to be used in the chapter in the book. And most of them are basically all wildflowers or quite indigenous species. I mean, the fritillarias and the scylla, uh, the, the digitalis are all native species that we have. And I love this. And he's, this is from Gardens, published in 1969. And he talks about shelter, perspective, light, walls, fencing, paving, maintenance, even tools and the plants. But the one he, he told me, he said, I never gave many lectures. He said, I think only about 10 that he used in Pennsylvania. And he said he thought the most important one was light because that's the way we see things of so dark and, and light. And that's where we read the landscape. But this is fun. And I think he knew exactly what he was doing. The elegance of cannabis sativa made it a favorite Victorian summer bedding plant, especially in town gardens. So here we have 1960s, um, and we have the uh, marijuana plant growing in there as a recommended plant for town gardens. I think it's great. I said, he knew exactly what he was doing. But this gives an idea, and this is so un-American in terms of the way the planting is being used. Uh, it's, it, it's much, much more English. And this was an unrealized scheme he had proposed in New York City for Central Park Zoo in 85. And you can actually, 86, you can actually see Peter's initial down here, PS 86. And occasionally, I think Annabelle had spotted, occasionally on some of his drawings, he actually puts how long it took him to draw these things. But I said, certainly a much more patient man at drawing and much better than I am. But I said, you get the feeling of much more English herbaceous planting than you do the American planting. And we'll see, see one which later on, which really is extraordinarily English in the center of Philadelphia. Um, in London now, Winfield House in Regent's Park is the American ambassador's residence, which he was commissioned to do a series of gardens, including the Rainbow Rose Garden, uh, which there was a proposed visit for, for gosh, which president? Uh, Ronald Reagan, I think it was. And so they wanted a rainbow garden because of the rainbow speech uh, that I think it was Reagan had made. And uh, he, he employed a specialist for the roses. Of course, it was never terribly successful. You're not going to get the colors of the rainbow, particularly the blues uh, of a rainbow in there. And I think quite a lot has been redone in here over the years. But one of the things he was specific about again was where this paving is laid in here, and you can see it in these walks, he wanted a gap. So you actually got a shadow. 
which is very good, but not too good for women in their high heels going through the garden. But there was a, a cutting garden. It was really a very English looking garden to relate to essentially an American Georgian style house. And gardens by theme in terms of the white garden. Uh, Annabelle assures me this is actually Peter's drawing. And it reminds me straight away of that space that we have at the end of Longwood that you come to something in here and that they're based mostly North American plants. And, and I spotted the in here the Cornus canadensis and I thought Cornus canadensis I really do like as a ground cover, but it really is that it's not going to put up much of a show. Uh, but uh, I haven't had time to really go in into this in, in a lot of depth, but it's really nice to see these because if you recall in the talk on, um, I think it was, yeah, it, it was the, the planting plan for Sutton Place uh, that Susan Jellico did. All her designs are things like the soft curving lines where the plants go and they're interlocking. And that's the way I was taught to do a planting plan. And then Peter does all these sort of geometric shapes and in blocks and different odd shapes and triangles and rectangles. And he said, it's much easier to do your count. It's much easier for the uh, gardeners to actually plant them or the contractors to plant them. And what will happen in time, the plants will find where they want to live and they will move themselves around rather than you worrying about it. So uh, there's a lot of common sense in that. And it does seem to work particularly well because he did the same thing at Charleston, which we have now. So <clears throat> he wanted to bring Charleston back to life. And this is of course, uh, Lytton Stretchy, uh, the Vanessa Bell, Duncan Grant, uh, Maynard Keynes, this lot, and he said they were really a very, very hedonistic lot altogether. And I think he thoroughly enjoyed working there. But what he wanted to do was keep this sort of wildness, like you can see in Duncan Grant's painting in the top right, in this garden. And he wanted the garden overflowing, the plants blending, jostling, not too precise, but sweet disorder. And I think, again, that just sounds so much like Peter, this idea of sweet disorder and let the plants find their own place where they want to live. Because in fact, the planting plan is very much the same that we just saw at um, Winfield House. And that you can see it's all done in geometric blocks. Yet the result in the long term and not that long becomes this quite a wild, sweet disorder of planting. Well Road, um, Hampstead, this was Peter's own house. This was not too long before he died. Um, and and the, the garden was getting a bit wild at that stage, but then he liked weeds. And of course we can see some of, there are some of his favorite plants in there, certainly quite a bit of iris in there. Um, and, and it was allowed to be a soft, gentle, sweet disorder uh, of a garden. But in terms of his planting, he liked the mix of native and exotic plants. He absolutely detested variegated plants and the idea of over hybridizing. And he particularly points out foxgloves. And remember, he liked these spiky, tall plants and the foxgloves, the flowers hang to one side, basically, whereas hybridizing them, they try and actually get the flowers to go all the way around. So it's lost some of its proper quality. Then he also refers to gruesome deformities of plants to avoid those and that the beauty of the plants lies within the form of the plants and they should look as though they were planted by nature. He also disliked enormous amounts of wild color uh, of bedding. He thought they were all, they were overused and so the, the, and, and they were meant to be seen close up, not in sort of mass displays. Then he does say and writes about hedges pose a dilemma because he actually he did like hedges and he liked them clipped and neat. And so again, that's that sort of architectural form 
going against the sort of wild um, sweet disorder of the planting that he proposes and that he likes so much. But as I said, hedges, he said, you know, they have to be clipped a couple of times a year. So there's a maintenance issue. But there's a maintenance issue with any sort of planting. It doesn't make any difference what you do. You still have to take care of it. And this is one, Emmanuel's Court, which is next to a church in Philadelphia, was done in the 1970s. And it took me a little while to find it. Um, and I think the strange thing is, it is just so English. It looks like if we put this into a black and white, it looked like an engraving from William Robinson in terms of the way the plants are arranged. And it's a very English, a very, very un-American thing. And he just put this simple sort of stone in the center, a hole drilled through it, and a recirculating pump, which uh, I said produces a very sort of quiet, genteel fountain, which I think is very much like Peter. He's quite quiet and genteel. He did refer to uh, being quite rude um, to some of the committee people at uh, Longwood Gardens over some issues. And I just could not imagine Peter being really rude. My guess is that they didn't find it that way at all until maybe a few days later when they realized what he said. And we're going to finish here. That's uh, coming up to 40 minutes uh, with a quote by Ian McCarg. I said, Ian McCarg was the one that invited him there to the University of Pennsylvania. Peter eventually became Dean, which did produce, I think, some conflicts between the practice in London and his work in in Philadelphia. And I, I will read this. It would be difficult to find a figure in the environmental profession at once so talented and so modest, as wide in scope and yet so meticulous in design, and yet so committed to human values as Dean Peter Shepherd, which I think is a magnificent accolade. Um, if you're not familiar with McCarg, I said he's one of the most influential people in terms of environmental issues in the latter part of the 20th century. And I think what I take from having the opportunity of interviewing Peter, talking to Peter, which was a great you know, thing and you know, great honor really, and then reading about him, reading what other people have written about him, reading about what he wrote of his own designs, is that there's a real strength and honor in the simplicity of design rather than overworking. There's an honesty in it. And I think that's what I really take away. And there's such simple details that he used and starts to make his work recognizable. We can spot his work once you know it. It's a signature. I was never quite happy with the uh, image on the left that Lord Snowden did in this sort of modernist chair with the trug next to him and the, uh, the gardening clothes. I, I always felt that's not really quite Peter. I think that's a little bit too much of a, a setup by Snowden. Um, I don't really want to say anything more, except uh, I, there is something, I said, I've learned so much about design quite late on in life um, from Peter Shepard and from Jeffrey Jellico looking at their work. Architects have always used precedent studies as part of their education. Landscape architects, have always said, we don't really have that much precedent. We don't have that many good designers or great designers. It's far from the truth. We have some brilliant people. We have some brilliant work that we can use as precedent to learn from. And to me, that's where the history of gardens, the history of landscape uh, is so important that we must take what we can from these people, from their work, from their writings uh, and, and learn from it. And, and there, there is really just so much uh, wealth in the work of these people. And I'll stop there. And this is just the announcement for the next session on the 25th of January, January with Annabelle and Annie on the JFK Memorial. Thank you. Ed, thank you so much. Um, what a brilliant talk and what fantastic images, graphics, pictures, photographs. I really appreciated that. And if I could just start by saying, Karen, you said absolutely correctly, fantastic to see a pre-picture for once. Um, <laughs> how often do we get that opportunity? So thank you very much, Ed. Um,
Annabelle has um, noted that, and I would agree with all the way that the Charleston planting has all changed now. Um, I think it's a very different um, environment from what yeah. um, Shepherd defined. And goes on to ask, would you suggest, or should we all suggest that Goldsmith's Garden be added to the Heritage England list? Absolutely. <laughs> it's, well, it is a gem. It really is. Um, so we will be coming back to you, um, uh, presumably to help us um, lobby. For <laughs> Karen has already volunteered, Karen, I see. Um, and Karen also asks, can you talk a bit about Margaret Maxwell's work with Peter? Now that I, is, is always quite confusing. I don't know enough about her. Annabelle knows far more. And <sighs> Margaret Maxwell certainly did quite a lot of the planting for Peter. Uh, the drawings I tried to show, I believe, are probably from Peter himself. And, and I believe the, um, the planting probably at Goldsmiths and, and at um, Cheney Walk are probably Margaret Maxwell. But I said, Annabelle has much more knowledge about that than I do. I did warn her that I would be passing things back to her. So Annabelle, would you care to unmute and contribute to our debate, please? Uh, yes, well, um, a bit I can. Uh, it's certainly uh, Margaret Maxwell did the planting, sorry, did the planting at um, both uh, Rupert's and um, at, at Goldsmith's Garden. And I think she, so I don't quite, can't quite remember what her background was, but she did architecture at um, Liverpool and was funded by somebody anonymously to do it. <laughs> and then um, uh, married uh, Bob Maxwell, the architect, and uh, she worked with Shepherd for, I think, many years. Thank you, Annabelle. Uh, mm -hmm. On Bunhill Fields as well, she did all the planting and all yeah. the measuring up for that as well. So I think uh, there's some of her work in, in the monograph. Thank you. No, good reason to take the monograph off the shelf or see if there are any copies around for sale if you wish to... Um... Um, read that very august tome. Um, Camilla comments, great to see the way that the challenges of bomb sites were turned to advantages, especially in the levels. Is there anything Ed you'd like or possibly Annabelle even to add to that comment? Well, I, 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 just, I just find it amazing that it wasn't built over with more apartment blocks. And, and I suppose an awful lot of engineers would probably have filled that site in and just gone to ground level with the whole thing. So again, I think it was the foresight that Peter had. And, and I, I did something not dissimilar um, some years ago in a square where it was a site that was bombed out during the war and the church was destroyed. So you had the undercroft left to it. I didn't know about Peter's work at the time, but I did the same thing on one side. And that is we had a wall, I raised it higher and that was the wall that faced the street so that anybody inside would be looking away from the street and the noise would be behind them with the simple idea that if, if you can't see the noise, it doesn't sound as loud. And also I said it was behind you. Um, so it's, you, you don't see it, it does reduce the noise a bit, but not significantly. But I think it's the visual thing. That's the important part of, of dropping those sights. Thanks, I think that's very interesting. I think um, uh, so. Um, Goldsmith's Garden was the site of a fire of London Church, and there were yes. restrictions on what what they could dig and not dig, which is why it's on two different levels. Um, but I think they were both uh, also like bomb sites during yes. the war. And mm. and I think there's a, a slide from Susan Jellicoe. Uh, uh, or in Tandy's collection, I don't know, I could, somewhere in the archives, there is of Goldsmith's garden uh, as the, the fire watches garden or whatever. So I think it's really interesting that they were both um, uh, being used. And I can't, and Peter never said anything about, you know, how he found Goldsmith's and what it was like, or, or you know, nor registered that it was important to a whole lot of people. I mean, all those people using that garden as for allotments or, pleasure or whatever 
I, I think I, that's very interesting. I'm sorry I didn't see that, you know, in time to ask him about it. Do we have any knowledge of whether there was any what we'd now call community consultation carried out before it was converted from all those mirrored uses to what he, he designed and had built? I have no idea on that. I don't know if, uh, no. uh, if Annabelle does. No. No, I don't. I, I would be surprised. I think you know I would, it was no. probably appointed mm. by the local authority, wouldn't that be by yeah. Kensington or Chelsea or whatever? I'm I'm not sure that community consultation was that strong a thing in the uh, 1960s. I would agree with that entirely. I think that's something <laughs> yeah. to come yeah. later. Yeah. Um, Karen, I think another reason Annabelle to register goldsmiths is a precedent to learn from. Karen, do you want to unmute and um, voice your own questions, question, uh, comment? Are you there? I'm here. Yeah. Hi, guys. Ed, um, I just love that. I, when I come to these, I just feel like I found my tribe, you know? I just love it. I'm just, it's just fantastic. Um, what, sorry, what did you ask me? <laughs> <laughs> would you like me to read your question for you or are you going to or comment or would you like to voice it yourself? Oh, yeah, no, it's just, I mean, I, you know, until I got involved in compiling the record, I didn't know about ropers or goldsmiths and Annabelle, if you don't mind me saying Annabelle, I think Annabelle was the person who nominated them. Um, and I was just, you know, along with a number of other sites, I was, I know Annabelle was disappointed it wasn't uh, registered, um, goldsmiths, and I was too. And I know there's been a lot of change and there's that great big office block thing, you know, that doesn't respect it at all. But I think Ed has shown this evening so many reasons why it should be listed, registered. Um, just the link and the link to America and everything. It's just fantastic to see this wider perspective of Shepherd's work. You also have a comment later, Karen, about um, input with the art. Can you expand yeah, on that? Yeah, no, bit? well, this, I don't remember stuff. This is really bad given my job. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I have a vague recollection when I was doing some research regarding ropers that local people had an input. Maybe it was to do with the Epstein that went in a bit later, but local people had a say into what went into the garden in terms of the artwork. Um, and I think, you know, the little, the statue in the middle, the original one that went in on the plinth in front yes. of the pergola. Um, sorry, who was that by? I should remember, but I, I don't. Um, Ledwood. Yes. Yes. So he had a studio nearby, didn't he? Was I think it was Epstein who had the studio oh, nearby. Epstein. Yeah, you see, I get things confused. OK, but, but, but there was some dialogue that went on, um, but I'd have to work very hard to pull it out of the recesses as to where I read it. Yes, but, but I think I, one of I, but I so, uh, Karen, I think one of your photos showed that the um, Epstein sculpture had been sort of like smacked in the middle of those hexagonal mm. little raised what Ed referred to as like the little secret garden at the end, yeah. which yeah. was a bit sort of crass, I thought. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and I don't think I mean I didn't find any evidence of um, consultation regarding the original shepherd design. You know, I'm just talking about the um, placement of the art in the place. Yeah. I mean, that's that's where I would say that Peter's work, everything fits together. Yeah. You know, and, and it was always a case of, again, when I was a student, it, the idea of a good design was if you add something to it that doesn't belong, you detract from it. If you take something away from it that belongs, you detract from that design. It's yeah, about yeah. that balance, that overall balance in the design. And, and I think that's where Peter, I believe, is so good. Things just seem to naturally fit together. Yes, yes. Talking of which, um, can I ask, did he ever leave any instructions on how he wanted his designs to look over the medium term? Obviously, a lot of his planting would have matured fairly quickly. Um, or did he just assume that the, the gardeners, the horticulturists, the local authority um, workforce would know what to do, would, how to get the best out of the individual material? Ah, OK, mm -hmm. so Goldsmith, sorry, can I interrupt? Yes, go. <laughs> so Goldsmith was then, Goldsmith's garden actually belonged to Goldsmith. So they appointed certainly uh, a, a head gardener there. And I think because um, she came, it was Sue Madden. She was fantastic. She was really meticulous about what had happened to the garden before she arrived. And there was some 
uh, Fire of London scene with bark mulch and edging and all the rest of it. She thought that was sort of highly inappropriate at the top level and wanted to have a look at the drawings and wanted to consult with, you know, us and all the rest of it, which was fantastic to try and get back to the spirit of um, what, what Shepard was doing there. So I think she understood and, and had copies of the drawings or took notes or whatever. And so she really had a fantastic feel of what uh, he and Margaret Maxwell were trying to do with the plants. I think she's probably retired now. And I think then there's a different hand. I don't think anybody's come back and had another look at the drawings or, or probably looked at the book or whatever. I think, and, uh, you know, in some of the other places, I suppose uh, Ropers is looked after by the local authority. And not wishing... it, was, it, was, it wasn't happy with the way they, uh, certainly at um, Ropers Garden, the way they hacked back. The, uh, oh. the planting along the walls, which were yeah. meant to come over and actually overhang to the other side. Yes. Um, and then he's also quite specific about the sort of plants that were to be used in those sort of quite narrow beds as well. So he does mention those in various bits of writing or places. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there may have been something then in the contract documents, actually, that was to do with maintenance. But mm -hmm. probably, you know, those probably weren't handed on. No, but I think the other thing, Annabelle, is these days we would be required to produce a management plan. Yes. Oh, yes. In those days, no such thing existed, really. No, 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 sure. Mm. Well, I mean, here's a PhD thesis for somebody out there. Um, when did the management plan crystallise as such in mm. post-war landscape architecture, mm. for instance? Um, and did people leave um, clear design aspirations with their drawings and I know what the answer is because I've earned good money from uh, trying to define what the design aspirations were on a scheme that I've been asked to renovate so I know the answer is no but so when did people start to be a little clearer on the more um, practical or philosophical aspects of where their landscape was going are we um, a, a, a profession of people, well, excluding myself, because I can't draw, who can draw, but um, don't leave the marginalia notes. Yes, possibly. I'm sure that must have happened. Yes. But I think there but must maybe, be... Maybe, I'm just looking at who's in this thing. Maybe Hal Mugridge has some something to add to that. I see he's still with us. Uh, how, how might, because he's got such long experience with practice, um, he, he might have some sort of idea on that. Hal, are you willing to join I've, I've sort of unmuted myself, but I'm not sure that I can add very much to what's been said. <laughs> I mean, I think that um, very few people left any documentation about how they wanted their designs looked after in the, in the long term. Yeah. I'm sure you're right, Hal, and I'm very honest of you to, um, to be honest, if you see what I mean. Um, that's brilliant. Thank you, everybody. Um, any more questions? I quite probably uh, got, ah, yes, what's this that's just coming in? Well, Ed, I think I'd better just read you some of the accolades that uh -oh. you've given me. <laughs> Thank you, Ed, for an inspiring talk. Wonderful to see those drawings. Um, let's just check. Yes, that's one. Um, Karen says that apologies just to go but thank you in capital letters, Ed, and Fola and Gardens Trust. I so enjoyed this talk except that it's just jumped out of my view. Um, especially delighted to hear Ed mention Ken Fieldhouse because I think, sorry, my computer's not helping me. Um, he's been forgotten a bit. He was very important to the profession in many ways. And if I can just add to that, it's very nearly 20 years now since we lost Ken. And I do think he deserves um, the work he did on the monographs, on landscape design, um, it really should be um, remembered and maybe that's something that Folo should do something about. Camilla, thank you for your comment. Thank you, fascinating. And 
I think then it's my turn now to pass over to Annabelle, if you would be so kind as to come in. Yeah, to yeah. absolutely. Thank you. Ed, fantastic. You always give us <clears throat> good value for money. <laughs> oh, yeah, you pay money? me so much. <laughs> 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 it's been a real pleasure and I'm and I'm so pleased actually that you put uh, Shepherd into this wider context. I think I, I must say that oh and I need to chase that up. So uh, um, there's a, an architect or the 20th century society have commissioned um, an architect to write about uh, Shepherd in terms of his architecture which will then complement our monograph which needs to be back in print again I'm sure mm -hmm. so but but wonderful I think what you've done this evening thank you so much and really for all the insights that you've offered I think it's always good to look at something twice or, or maybe even three times Ed you know like oh. once writing the monograph and now mm -hmm. reviewing what you've written because I think you do come up with different things, don't you? It, it, you see things differently. I must admit, it made me go back and look, because I haven't looked at the work for a long, long time now. Mm -hmm. You know, it's quite a few years ago that we did this. So, mm -hmm. um, and and I, there's nothing better, I think, than time to reflect on things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to re-examine things. Yeah. Uh, and to formulate your ideas more clearly. Yes, absolutely. So... Thank you. Always, always a pleasure. Well, I have, I have to thank Annabelle because she's the one that gets me into all these things. And, uh, <laughs> it takes two to tango, mate. That's all I can say. 